All right, so I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a brief intro. Um, you guys will have to believe it's really me, even though I'm not going to tell any jokes. Um, this could not have been more topical, and yet we were working on this months ago. Um, so you know the timing of it, the the, the stars kind of aligned. Um, the sad part about where the gaming industry is at today is that there's a whole generation of people that grew up playing games that wanted to work in the industry, that that was their dream. And instead they get hired at a number of places, and I'll let you do that whole listing, and that dream turns into their nightmare. Um, so that's, that's gonna be really the, the topic that we're gonna cover. Um, I have worked with Kate for quite a while considering how young we both are. <laughs> um, and I can't think of a better spokesperson to have for, um, for why the industry has to change. So without further ado. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I know we've been, we have been talking about this for months uh, for me and it just aligned perfectly because two days ago I was in Hollywood with plaster all over me. Uh, that's the main reason I flew down south. Um, I'm getting a new version of my Thor armor. Um, ready, so that's because I cosplay, but we'll get there later. Um, anyway, so basically, just a little bit of background. I, as of last month, it was my 26th year working in the game industry, and yeah, 1994. Um, is that yeah or no? When it, whatever it was. So back then, yeah. So um, yeah. So I've been around a long time. 13 years of that was at Microsoft, and uh, my background. I'm actually a geographer and a cartographer. And so what I've done in the game industry is what I call culturalization work. So I basically help game developers avoid political and cultural mistakes that get them into big trouble with governments, that get them banned, that gets consumers uprising against them and all that kind of stuff that's really fun and exciting. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. Um, what I want to do is start out by reading an email that I got late last year, and it's very typical of an email that I, that I often get. I usually get one of these, at least one or two of these per month. Um, I left the IGDA position back in June of 2017, but I've still been very active with advocacy work, and I still get a lot of emails from students in particular. So I'm going to read this email as I go through a few slides about some things that we were very familiar with. So she said, Dear Ms. Edwards, last year I attended one of your lectures at our school and you inspired me. Um, as you may have heard, in September and October, multiple controversies in our industry came up and this is what I'm mailing you about. Within our school, we have a Slack channel that we use to discuss things that are going on in the industry right now. Recently, the incidents at Telltale Games and Rockstar Games, um, <sighs> sorry, uh, yeah, now this thing just disappeared. Sorry. Okay. Uh, where did it go? So that's what happens with touch screens. This is a user. This is actually more of a user error issue. Um, okay, hang on a sec. My apologies. There we go. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so um, within our school, we have a Slack channel that we use to discuss things that are going on in the industry right now. Recently, the incidents at Telltale and Rockstar came up. We got into a lot of discussion about this and about what we need to do within our school teams to minimize this behavior. In the Slack channel, I see a lot of, quote, we need to unionize the gaming industry messages. And I see a lot of, quote, we need to get out of this mindset um, messages. But it doesn't give me anything I feel any of us could possibly work with. They're just words. But to be honest with you, these incidents worry me. I'm concerned that when I come out of the university, I'll be forced to work many hours crunching. As you see in these incidents, after all, these stories are not at all uncommon in the industry. I fear that while I love video games and I'm passionate about creating them, I will no longer be able to see my loved ones and I'll be forced to work at a company that enforces ridiculous working habits as part of their, quote, culture. As mentioned, we've discussed a lot with our school about what we could do, but I'd like to ask you, what can we, the students of today and the developers of tomorrow, do against these practices? What steps can we take? What are ways we could prevent this from happening? After all, we are the next generation of this industry. Is there anything that we can do? Right now, I'm mainly afraid of what future awaits me. 
And so we have this problem where we are uh, facing ourselves. Um, good grief, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I wasn't in, uh, <laughs> in presentation mode. Uh, anyway, so these are some of the stories that I was uh, cycling through, um, things that we're very familiar with that happened last year. 2018 happened to be a, quite the shit show for our industry. It really, truly was. I mean, practically every single month, there was an incident that was kind of shocking and major, not just kind of the normal rumblings of ev every year where we see like maybe every quarter we'll hear about another set of layoffs or something going on. It seemed like there was something major going on almost every month of last year and of course into this year as well. And so this student was reacting to these stories, of course, and she, it was really worrying her. And she was just one example, just one of the people who reached out to me in the midst of this, because I do a lot of outreach and a lot of mentoring of students, and it really worries her. And so basically, she's in this mindset, I'm, you know, I'm afraid of what future awaits me. And so she has that conflict, as many people do, both those who are entering this industry as well as those who are even in this industry, is how do you reconcile that immense passion for the medium and that desire to create games with the conditions under which you're forced to create them? And so what can she do? In, in light of this, and in, in what she's saying, what can you do? And what, more importantly, what can we do? Is really the question that we have to face ourselves with. Um, I asked myself this as, uh, as well at some point, but a lot of times when I give a talk about advocacy or I talk about these issues to developers, these are the kind of responses I get. Well, who am I? I'm just this person doing this job at some company or I've got my indie studio or something. What can I do? I don't have what it takes. Isn't it enough? that I'm just making my game and just gonna release it and hope that it's successful and everything's good and nice. Well, you know, it's, it, we're, well, let's talk about that. So I asked myself that. So this is a little bit of autobiography here um, because I was not always an outspoken advocate for the industry. In fact, I was anything but. When I was, a, when I was a kid, even into my early college years, I was just like almost a mute. I was so shy, just so ridiculously shy. I almost, I would not hardly even talk to my own little, click of friends. Um, but anyway, so we all have labels that we can apply to ourselves. We're all kinds of different things at any time of the day or any time of the year, or whatever it might be. Um, the geek label really applies to me, as you'll see very quickly here. Um, that's me giving a lecture on Halloween in Norway a couple of years ago because I have to, you know, it's Halloween. It's, and it, what makes it geeky, I'm actually talking about my work on Star Wars The Old Republic. So I'm d demonstrating force lightning while dressed as Indiana Jones. Um, but it gets worse, because like when I speak in Tunisia, what do you do? Well, you go to the original Lars Homestead, of course. Or um, last year, right before Gamescom, I had to be in Ireland to speak at a conference. So you go to Skellig Michael and recreate scenes from Star Wars, because why, why wouldn't you? Um, or in Dubrovnik, um, this was last year, not this year. I was, I was just in Dubrovnik a couple weeks ago, but you recreate scenes from Game of Thrones because that's what they film there. Um, so yeah, so I'm a huge geek. But so how did I make a transition though to the, towards the advocacy angle? Because in my later years in the industry, I mean, I, was, I definitely shifted in that direction. Um, well, part of the issue is having to deal with my own inner conflict, and I've talked to a lot of people that have this same kind of issue. And so this, this is where we're getting into a little bit of a public service announcement about, about dealing with our own demons, so to speak, uh, because we kind of have to push through them in order to get to a point where we're willing to take that extra step of speaking out. Now, for me, my, my whole conflict started in the matrix. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So I'm a huge movie score geek in addition to being a geek about other things. So I love movie scores. And one time the Seattle Symphony, like as many symphonies do, they were doing the entire Matrix movie, singular Matrix movie. Um, so they were, they were doing, you know, where they show the movie above the stage and the orchestra plays the music live. And in fact, Don Davis, the composer of the, of the music, was there to conduct his own music. So it was amazing. It was really cool. Now, I went to this concert at a time when I was dealing with a huge issue. Um, I was already in my self-employed consulting mode for several years. I'd been in the industry at that point for, I don't know, at least 15 years. And um, I was really struggling with this issue of why is it that every single time I email a client, 
with a response to a problem that they have in some game, I feel like hyper nervous. Like this is the moment where they're going to find out that I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. So then we all deal with this to some degree. Um, we've, we've always dealt with this at some points, but while this really was coming to a head for me when I went to this concert, I was really struggling with this. Like, why can't I push through this? Because it was really holding me back. And so I'm watching the movie, and of course it gets to this part where, um, and I'm sh I would hope everyone has seen this movie. I realize it's 20 years old, so some of you probably were like, you know, very small. But um, if you haven't seen this movie, you should see this movie. Anyway, it gets to this point where Morpheus, the, the mentor of the protagonist, Neo, says to him, don't think you are, know you are. And in that moment, when I'm sitting in the symphony hall, I just start bawling my eyes out, just crying like crazy. And the friend that went with me was just like, it's not that, it, it's not that big of a deal, really. But, but I realized what hit me really hard in that moment was that I was struggling with disbelief in my own skills and realizing that disbelief in my own skills does not make them disappear. There's a reason why people come and hire me for my consulting work, just like there's a reason they hire you for your work and they hire other people to do their jobs, and yet we can't accept the fact that we actually have value. We have skill, we have experience, we actually can bring something to the table to make change happen in the environment in which we're working. And so I had to grasp that I had to know the reality of what others perceived in me, even if I struggled to think about whether or not I had those skills. And so my own thinking process, I had to divorce it from that notion of, of knowing the reality of others. And it, that was a huge epiphany for me, honestly. I mean, that moment in sitting in that symphony hall, when I really kind of processed what had happened there, the emotions around it, I came out of that quite different. Um, and of course, this is what we call imposter syndrome. This is something that pretty much every human being deals with. Um, it's not really a syndrome, it's a human behavior. Syndrome implies that it's like something that you contract and then you get rid of it eventually. Um, you can overcome it, uh, which is kind of what I more or less did. But typically this is what imposter syndrome looks like, where you're in amongst your peers and it's like you feel that what you know is so inferior and minor to everyone around you. So everyone around you knows far more than you do regardless of the level of experience they have, even if there's someone junior than you, you still sometimes have those feelings. Um, but the reality is that what you know is basically on par with everybody else. I mean, you can have a room full of artists and every artist brings their own experience, life experience, their life journey, everything to the art. I mean, that informs their style, it informs their approach to the art, and that's one of the beauties of what we do in the creative field, is that our life experience feeds into the outcome of what we create. And so, yes, if you if that looks sort of like a Death Star, it's intentional. So don't, don't think about Death Stars, think about nice flowers, don't think about imposters. So, um, so, you know, I often will put pictures like this up to a room full of people and I'll say, which one is better? You know, and so of course you'll get people saying, well, I like the one on the left to the one on the right. Well, that's personal preference, but how is it objectively better? Now, if you don't know, the one on the right, or the one on the left is Rembrandt, the one on the right is Picasso. So two of the greatest artists in human history, vastly, vastly different styles, obviously, vastly different approaches to the, to the subject matter of make a portrait. Um, but and yet they're completely valid in every way, in, this, in much the same way that these two forms of art are very much different, and yet they are just as valid as, as each other. I encounter people who really look down their nose at 8-bit and pixel artists, and all these people are saying, that's not real art. It's like, it's a style. It's like pointillism. It's a certain kind of style. Just because it's not photorealistic doesn't discount it as being good. Um, and so one of the things that I often warn people about is this idea of comparison. This is what kills a lot of us in our careers. It's actually what stops us from taking more action when we feel that we should, and it's this idea of comparison. Because when I get to the root of the problem, when I talk to so many people in this industry and talk to students, it's they always eventually will point out, like, I'm really intimidated by that person because they're so much better than me, and I will never be as good as them, whether it's coding or writing or art or whatever it might be. And I'm just like, well, yeah, comparison is the death of joy. It eats you from the inside. And of course, I, then I tell these people, it's like, well, guess what? You just found a potential mentor. Go ask them to like show you how to do what they do. Um, 
And so for myself, I kind of went through this own process where I basically had to embrace basically who I am, take that adversity that I was dealing with and embrace it and embrace it as the crucible that was essentially changing who I was, both professionally and personally. Um, I saw it as something of a forge. Um, if you follow the writings of Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Power of Myth, upon which you know the Star Wars saga and other heroic journeys are based, they called it the supreme ordeal, where basically you start out as a, quote, normal person, and you have some horrendous thing happen to you, and you emerge from that being heroic, um, you know, or you embrace your superpowers. Basically, you go from being normal to wearing spandex and showing your muscles. But um, now for myself, what was interesting is when I went through this process um, over the course of a couple of years after I sort of had that matrix epiphany, I actually had a lot of friends saying, you're different. And they, this is the weird, the word they were using for me was fierce. Like you seem fierce now. You're not quiet anymore. You speak up. I'm not being, I don't mean speak up in like a rude way, like dropping F-bombs at people and everything. Well, I, I will do that sometimes, but um, but they 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 saw a change in attitude where I was unwilling to sit back and let things just happen because I was got to a point where I was willing to push p past and actually engage on the problem that's in front of me rather than just kind of say, well, you know, that's the way it is. That's just it just happens, and it kind of is interesting because it sort of coincides with when I started cosplaying more too. Part of the reason is because my daughter's a costume designer, so you know she actually helps me out with this. But it's funny because I get a lot of people ask me, why do you cosplay? And I said, well, it's fun. It's something I do with my daughter. But also what I love about it is that like when I'm dressed as Thor, for example, I feel like it's the external representation of how I feel about myself. And I like that. It's kind of cool to show that off every once in a while. So basically, who am I when it came back to that question was basically I'm somebody who just decided to give a shit. And that's the only difference. Really, it's the, it's the only difference between me and anybody else in this industry is I just made a very conscious decision, a very conscious decision that I am not going to stand by any longer. And a big reason is because of this saying, evil triumphs when good people do nothing. And I actually made a very conscious decision that I am not going to just stand by. And now, of course, I have friends and colleagues who say, well, you sound like you have a hero complex. So what? Maybe I do. I don't care. It works for me. Um, that's one of those things I like when we consume so much geek media, which I think many of us do because it's something that we're very proud of. And it's, it's something that feeds our creativity as well. Like I love this scene in the movie Wonder Woman, which I've talked to a lot of people, men and women, who reacted very emotionally to this one particular scene in this movie. The moment when you finally see Wonder Woman you know, as herself climbing out of the trench trying to basically resolve this conflict. And when you know Steve Trevor says to her, we can't save everyone in this war, it's not what we came to do. And she just flatly says, no, but it's what I'm going to do. And as I've talked about this moment with certain people, I think a lot of the reason for the emotional reaction is because it's such an aspirational moment. It's like, wouldn't it be cool if I could be that kind of person who just says, screw it, I'm gonna be the one who goes and tries to stop this. And that's something of the feeling that I had having gone through my own personal crucible and deciding consciously that I'm going to try and change things. Now, why the game industry though? I, I mean, I'm a geographer. I don't technically don't really belong here. So, but my game history goes back to this. That's why it's like I was about seven years old where, when Pong showed up in our local Sears store, um, which that whole building doesn't exist anymore in Southern California. But this was my first video game. I fell in love with games way, way back when, when I was just a kid. And I have tremendous love for this medium, as we all do. I have a lot of admiration for you and all the amazing people I've worked with all, over all these years on all kinds of franchises from like all the Age of Empires and Halo and Fable and Rise of Nations and Call of Duty and all the Bioware games of the last 18 years and all that stuff. Just amazing, amazing talent. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for that. And of course, we all share this passion as well. And yes, that does that is an Easter egg for LARP. But anyway, um, the thing that I find concerning, though, I meet a lot of people, as we all do every day, where we're full of rage about something that happens. You know, like we're do focusing just yesterday on the walkout at Riot and all the stuff going on there. I see a lot of tremendous rage on Twitter and people being angry on Facebook and everywhere else. And that's fine. You can be angry and you can express that and express your concern over these things. But that's not enough. You know, social media, frankly, it doesn't change jack shit. It doesn't. 
action changes things, not social media. And so it's a, more about this concept that I happen to call for myself righteous rage. And what I mean by that is basically it's this reactive emotion of anger in response to so essentially it's a rebuke of injustice where I see things happening that I consider to be wrong. And I do look at the world that way. People can, we can talk metaphysics around that, but I do believe that there are some things that are always wrong. Like excessive crunch is always wrong. You know, unequal pay is always wrong. I, I think these, you know, treating indies like crap and taking advantage of them in a contract when a publisher does this, and I know publishers who do, we, I talked to some of them at GDC this year, and that's wrong. That's just always wrong to me. And so it's, you're right to be angry about it, but the, the righteous part of it is like, why exactly are you angry? And what, more importantly, are you actually going to do about it? And of course, another word for righteous rage is advocacy. That's basically what advocacy is. You talk to anybody who runs a nonprofit association, they're not doing it for the money. I can guarantee you that. I did not run the IGDA for money. I can definitely guarantee you that. I did it because I wanted to change the industry and I want conditions to be better for developers. And so that's what drives us. You know, people who run nonprofits, they're doing it for all the causes that they believe in, environmental, political, social, whatever it might be. And in our case, of course, it's changing our industry for the better. Now, I had a great time when I ran the IGDA for five years. I had a tremendous amount of interaction with people all over the world, traveling all over the place, meeting with developers of every particular kind you can imagine, from the solo indie dev in a garage, in a literal garage, to massive AAA, meeting with government officials, um, all kinds of people, meeting with startups in emerging markets that were just super inspiring to me. They're under the worst kind of conditions. I mean, they're in, under conditions where they don't have constant electricity or the internet's really, really expensive to use. Or in some cases, like they can't do any online transactions because the banking system in their country is so antiquated. So how do you as an indie actually collect money when there's no online transactions? Uh, and yet they f were being very resourceful to figure out how do they actually do this. Um, and so it was, it was just super cool to be able to have that experience. And in all of the time I was going around, this was actually Morocco, that was really fun. And this was in Tunisia. This is actually was the Minister of Telecommunications for the country. And the amazing thing is, you know, I know people will think, well, it's Tunisia, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's a progressive Muslim country in North Africa. It's where the Arab Spring started back in 2011. Um, what's really cool is that this guy, he's no longer the minister, but at the time when he was serving, he had this amazing vision for growing the game sector in Tunisia and creating like 5,000 jobs in the country. It was just really inspiring. I also thought it's extremely challenging given that there's like 30% unemployment in Tunisia and a lot of other infrastructure problems. But the interesting thing though, is that you can't just assume, well, as many people do, well, it's like, well, it's Tunisia, they're not, they're not pro games or anything. This guy used to co-own a game company in the, in the UK when he lived there. This guy was so pro games. He loved video games and he wanted to see that kind of success replicated in Tunisia. And then just last year I was in Iran. I went to the Tehran Game Convention. It's just a thriving, game development community in Iran. You know, and of course the problem there is that with all the economic sanctions and the political bullshit going on, they can't get their games out of the country. And so they have a lot of tremendous challenges. I mean, they're just as creative as anyone here. They have that same passion as anyone here, and yet they're having all of those other layers of struggle, and yet they're trying still to push through it and do the best they can. Um, now, I tried my best when I was running the IGA to affect a lot of issues. It's not an easy job to do. Um, you know, there was a lot of things we tried to address, you know, diversity and inclusion. Um, I happened to be the executive director during Gamergate, which um, was not a fun, fun time to be a woman in a leadership position in the game industry, being one of their primary targets. Um, but we forged on and, and went ahead. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different things we are trying to address. Um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, and on and on it went. Um, and then, of course, when I left, I also joined the board of Take This, which is an organization that focuses on mental health in the game industry, because that was one of the very common themes I heard across any developer anywhere in the world is the toll, the mental health toll of, of, doing, this, of doing this work. And even though it's this outpouring of passion, as we all know, it's just like, but that passion, is there is a cost to it. It is a resource that has to be managed very carefully because you will lose it or you can lose it if you don't manage it well. 
and I kn I've met many people in this industry who, well, pe people who used to be in this industry, and it's one of the saddest things I ever encounter is finding someone who is now they're working like, I don't know, at Google or somewhere, you know, at some tech company, but they, they basically, they never lost their love of the medium, but they're, they're, they lost their love of creation in the medium because of all this other crap going on. And they were so negatively affected by it, whether it was a mental health issue or some other political issue within a company or excessive crunch or something. They basically just, that passion for actually creating the medium just got completely drained and there was no way for them to recover it. Um, yeah, this was during, during Gamergate, this was really not a fun time, but you know, we soldiered on and um, you know, it's like, this is what happens when you speak out against this kind of thing. This is what happens when you're the only people speaking out against it. And I'm on the phone talking with CEOs of different companies in this industry during this time saying, why aren't you saying something about this? Why aren't you making a statement about this? One of the very few people who had said anything was Mike Morheim when he was running Blizzard at the opening of BlizzCon in 2014. He actually made a comment about this. But other than that, most everyone else was silent. So again, evil triumphs when good people do nothing. And during this time, to me, that's exactly what was happening in our industry is that most of these companies were doing absolutely nothing. And they're like, well, it's a consumer issue. We don't want to make them angry. It's just like, ah, okay, yeah, this was really, really fun. Really, really fun. Um, anyway, moving on. So the number one thing I learned in the five years that I ran the ITDA, hands down above everything else, was basically this notion that, that game creators want leverage. They ultimately want some way to control their circumstances under which they work. Now, normally this takes on this, this basically labor versus management dynamic. And there, there is obviously a huge, that is a huge part of this. Um, but that's essentially what I was hearing from a lot of developers all over the place was that leverage is what they wanted. The ability to push back on a publisher and, and be able to negotiate more clearly with them. The ability to report sexual harassment and actually have something done about it. Um, the ability to actually not the ability to actually opt out of crunch and not have negative repercussions. You know, you're not a team player. You're not part of the group. You know, uh, yeah, we're going to guilt you into, you know, basically quitting the company, all that kind of bullshit. Um, now, looking at some of the, you may not be able to read this very well. Um, but so when I was running the IGDA, we created this developer satisfaction survey, which was an evolution of the old uh, quality of life survey that the IGDA used to do. And so when we asked this question, the reasons for wanting to leave the game industry, you can see here, I want a better quality of life is by far the number one answer that people provided. So basically these issues that were impending, you know, that were affecting their work life um, is, was the number one thing. And then we asked which of these reasons captures why you chose to be self-employed or contract or freelance. And again, more control over working conditions, the number one answer. And some of these other ones, more control over content, make the games I want to make. I mean, these are also showing that that very strong creative spirit that I think all of us have that ultimately, as we talked about in some of these other questions, when we ask people, ultimately, what do you want to do? Well, the, the biggest answer was, I want to work for myself. I want to create my stuff, which is very consistent with pretty much any other creator or any other creative field that you'll find, writers, filmmakers, you know, people who paint, all of those kind of people, it's very consistent with the same approach that they would take. Um, and then we asked, do you feel there's equal treatment or opportunity in this industry? And of course, the, the answer, the majority answer was no, no or not sure. Um, so these sentiments were piling up and we see all this year over year that when we got, when we asked these questions. So of course, crunch and work-life balance was like a huge point that came up all the time. You know, the number one answer every single time when I talked to people, even before I left the IGDA, I would talk openly about unionization because I wanted to know why do, why do people see that as an answer? Why, why is that appealing to you? Always the number one answer is because I don't want to crunch anymore. That's what people, that's why they responded like, that's why I want a union. Uh, we'll get into that question later. Um, also, it's this general sense of unfairness that they saw. Unfairness in promotions, nepotism, all these other things are going on in different companies. Now, of course, the game industry is not unique for that. I mean, we're, 
you know, we're part of a larger IT sector where it also has a lot of problems with it. And we're part of a society which also has some issues. So, I mean, but they just saw that as one of the things that kept coming up, such as, like I mentioned before, how publishers will often treat indies or take advantage of them because the indies have that absolute desperation. Or you've got incoming talent into the industry who also are desperate to get that first job. And so they're just like, I'll take whatever you got give it to me. I don't care what the working conditions are. I don't care what the pay is. I just want to be able to say I'm working in the industry and make my dreams come true. Um, toxic work environments. We've heard a lot about this lately. Um, you know, Riot's not the only one, but that's the one that's kind of been called out the most over the last year or so. And of course, just this sense of growing collective dissent. Um, as I've gone around and talked to a lot of people, it's not just one person saying it. It's groups of people at a certain company saying it. So it's kind of this there's a certain level of courage it takes to come forward and to say these kinds of things um, and, and to be the one who actually makes that first statement. I mean, that's kind of what happened with the Me Too movement in Hollywood. It was one person, one person who decided to make that initial statement, and then it, from there it just kind of immediately exploded. Um, so what I challenge people to be is be something like a warrior poet, if you've heard that term before. But in our case, I call us ourselves creator advocates. So to me, it's not just enough to create games, but also create them with the sense of advocacy kind of in the background as you're doing what you're doing. And that could be any level, <coughs> excuse me, of engagement that you want it to be. For some people, that advocacy takes the form of changing like a one process within your company. For others, it, it's changing the entire way that the industry is doing something. Um, for others, it's like the, it's the public perception of the game industry, which tends to be pretty crappy still. Even despite the fact that games are ubiquitous and played by most people out there, there was a 2015 Pew Research study that showed that 40% of adults in the US still believe that games absolutely cause violence which is an argument that was refuted by our Supreme Court in 2011 when we won the free speech rights for games. And, and yet the general public still believes that perception. It's like, why are we not trying to control this message? Where's the ESA in all this? Where's the IGDA in all this? Why are we not trying to change that public perception in a more meaningful way? And that's why, to me, we have to take on this role as creator advocates, not just creators. And uh, so what can we do to try and build a better industry? Well, we can talk about this for days, but let's talk about a few things. First of all, there's two fundamental things I think is really important. And I bring these up because I still meet a lot of developers who don't seem to realize this. And so my first point, embracing our craft for what it really is. In my view, games represent the current evolution of human narrative. These are all these other forms of medium or media that have been created over the years. Of course, this is a very simplified list. I mean, this could be much more granular, but basically these are all different ways that human beings have conveyed story and narrative from one generation to another over the many centuries that we've been around, the many eons we've been around. And so games happened, in, in my view, we are the current evolution of this. We are the ones who are determining how narrative gets passed along. It just happens to be very you know, heavily technology-based, but that's the way our society is as every one of these other forms of media were also based on prevailing technology in their time. And so I, I see that as no small role to play. I think we should be really damn proud of the fact that that is a role that we're playing. And stop thinking about like, well, we're, we're, how we compare ourselves to film or television. Who gives a crap? It's like, we're games. We, we are what we are. And people out in the public already recognize what we are because they're playing the games. I mean, it's pretty much, like I said, it's ubiquitous. It's pretty much everyone plays to some degree. The other thing we have to embrace, I think, is understanding our economic power. I think a lot of us do understand this to a certain degree because a lot of us, I, I hear a lot of developers quote that statistic that games make more money than film and music combined. It's true. Here's the monies for, for fiscal year 2017. So here's how games compared to even printed books. You know, there's, there's music in cinema and there's DVDs and all that kind of stuff, recorded music over there. Yeah, we're ridiculous. We make so much money. The thing that's even more impressive to me at least the one statistic I find really impressive is that if you add up all live sports around the world, FIFA, NFL, MLB, every form of live sport, we still make more money than all live sports on a global scale. We're big. We're, we're a going concern. And yet I still meet a lot of people who think we're like kind of, we're scrappy startups. 
It's like, well, your company might be, but we as an industry are a behemoth. You know, I, I laugh how everyone's making a big deal about how much Endgame is made in the first, you know, 10 days or so. I think that's great. Guess what? What did, what, Grand Theft Auto made that in five days? <laughs> Grand Theft Auto V made a billion dollars in five days. Of course, that includes pre-sales, but hey, so does the movie. Uh, so the movie uh, adds that up too. So yeah, that's cute. Well done, Endgame, that's great. So, you know, welcome to the club. Um, <laughs> And I also think that's super important. One of the things in, in my engagement with the public, and I still do a lot of engagement with the public in the form of government officials and people actually in the public, um, is opening up the black box of game creation. I think this is one of the most important things we can do to kind of to help chart, start changing that public perception of who we are and what we do. Because I still get a lot of people thinking that game developers are these weird, lazy people who can't get real jobs, you know, and they, they basically found a way to waste their time making these games, and they think we sit around, you know, some people actually think we sit around wondering how violent can I make this game? Hmm. Now, we do that sometimes. I worked on all the Dead Rising games. We did talk about how to make it how violent, because that's Dead Rising. That's the nature of that game. But for the most part, we don't do that just for gratuitous purposes. We're doing it to serve the narrative and to serve the experience. So most game development ecosystems are comprised of these three, three components. We have the game creators, or you could call it the industry, whatever you want to call it. Um, you've got the government, and you've got the education piece. And so pretty much any country in the world, you've got at least those three pieces that have to exist in order to have a viable ecosystem for creating, game to, for creating games. One of the biggest challenges in a lot of emerging markets, they, well, of course, everywhere has a government, um, but they may have education systems, but not many game creators or vice versa. It's usually the, one of those two is lacking severely. And usually it's the education piece because you're always, you have indies everywhere. Indies are, exist everywhere on the planet, no matter where you, no matter where you look. Um, you know, even last, that was, yeah, earlier last year, I went up to uh, the Sami game jam. The Sami are the indigenous people up in northern Finland and Sweet in Norway and Sweden, way up there above the Arctic Circle. So I went to a game jam way up there, and there's game developers up there above the Arctic Circle, the Sami people creating games about their culture. And so it's like, we're, we're everywhere, and it's awesome. Um, so... When I talk about a game development ecosystem, I don't really care about the game playing public. They're not, I mean, yeah, well, I do, I do care about them. Let me take that back. We care about them because, they, of course, they pay our wages. Um, but the other thing is that they already believe in what we do. They're already our allies. And so I think one of the things we need to do better is engaging them as actual allies to change the perception, especially in the education and government circles. Um, so, for example, with the government part of it, when I was in Colombia a couple of years ago, I talked to the Minister of Communication for the country. And so he was visiting an a indie game studio there. This was in Bogota. And so I asked him, as I often ask uh, government officials, so what are games, what are games to you? What, how do you perceive video games? This was his answer, almost verbatim. He says, I see video games as one of the cornerstones of my country's future. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> unpack that for me. And he says, the reason is because games bring together, unlike almost any field we have, games bring together all these other disciplines, technology, engineering, the arts, all of this stuff comes together in one big pile. And he says, I can use that to justify a really strong education system that, that feeds people into this game industry. And that same education system can also help every other discipline in the country. And I'm like, I don't know what's in your water here, but can you help? I want to bring some back to Washington, D.C., because that kind of enlightened progressive attitude is really rare. I don't even see that in the U.S. very much. Um, I don't see that in, even in Europe in places. Uh, and so it's just really exciting. I mean, the fact that, like, Medellin, for example, in Colombia, which used to be like the capital of the cocaine trade 30 years ago, is now a thriving game development center in Colombia. And it's like, it's just super cool. Um, anyway, my point about this is that I think the non-playing non public are basically the ones who are going to continue to knee-jerk. But unfortunately, the media dynamic right now continues to listen to these people a lot. You know, and, and these people complain to the government because they have lobbyists. And so they'll complain and say, hey, I saw this game where somebody got their head shot off and I don't like that. And unfortunately, we still live in an era where government officials tend to react to games as if they're defective toys. 
and that's generally how they react. So if a game makes somebody upset, it's like we have to regulate that game in much the same way that if you had a Frisbee that every time you threw it, it would fly back and hit you in the head every single time, it's defective. You have to regulate it, take it off the market. And, and so we're still kind of in that era. I think we're getting to the tail end of that era. And of course, this is a generational thing. Eventually, every single person in these governments will have grown up with video games and with consoles and with smartphone games. And so it's going to radically shift okay. yeah. the perception. Of course, then those people who are going to be making legislation about Hold games it. will be all upset about all these radically new AR and VR stuff saying, this is really disturbing to me. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, my point in bringing this up is really, I think we as game creators need to do a lot better job of directly engaging the public because one thing that is different from film, most people in the public understand how films get made. They, there's films about filmmaking and pre everyone pretty much knows. You have a director, you've got actors, you've got a camera, you do all this stuff. You know, a lot of people don't have any clue how games get made. They're just, it's just like this mysterious black box and they're just like, well, like, you kind of have, you have people who do art and stuff, but I have, really don't have any idea how games get made. And so like one studio in Canada told me a great story where they were having a problem with a certain minister, uh, member of parliament in their, in their province in Canada. And um, this member of parliament was really anti-video game. It's like games are bad, games cause violence, blah, blah, blah. So what they did, they opened their door, literally, they invited him to visit their studio for a day. They, of course, they set this all up and made sure they had everything ready for him. They sat him down, let him try playing with 3D modeling and ZBrush. And they let him try some other stuff and they showed him like what prototyping and wireframes look like and all these other things. They let him try different you know, interface devices. He got to meet a lot of the people at the company. Um, he saw that these are cool, normal people. They've got families. They pay taxes. Yeah, you know, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. Within one day, this guy flipped 180 degrees. He's like, I need to support these people. This is like a real industry. This is like real tech people here. One day, that's all it took. Now, I think that's really outside. That's an outlier. It's not going to take most... For most, it's not going to take one day. But I do think we can do a lot better about basically opening our doors. So when I do hear developers bitch and moan about like local politicians or local media or something, I ask them, when's the last time you invited them to actually come to your studio and find out what you do? Of course, the answer is never. Usually, it's like we haven't ever done that before. It's like, well, now's, now's the time to maybe perhaps do that. Um, now, the other thing I think we have to think about is embracing our collective voice. And this is something that has become a theme over the last year. Certainly in response to a lot of the stories that we heard last year, the ones that I was showing previously, we saw a lot of these media stories come up about unions and unionization. And so this topic has been around forever. I mean, as long as I've been in the industry, people have talked about unions. Because a lot of times we'll look to the film industry and say, well, look what they get. They have these unions and people are protected and they've got, you know, they are guaranteed certain rates and all that kind of stuff. So why can't we have that too? Well, it's not obviously just games. It's the entire tech sector has this issue as well. I mean, I remember when I was at Microsoft, we had all kinds of discussions about organizing within Microsoft as if that was going to happen. Um, but at least in Washington State, there was a union formed of tech contractors and that does exist. Of course, that happened after I left Microsoft. But anyway, um, but there was eventually a push because there was a general concern that a lot of contractors in the tech sector were getting treated really poorly um, by certain companies. Um, and there was actually, at one point, there was a lawsuit against Microsoft for, for hiring permatemps. I was one of those. Three and a half years, I was a contractor. And eventually, they had to change the rules in response to a lawsuit so that contractors then had to work only like nine months. They had to have a break. And then there was all these conditions put on when they could come back and under what conditions. So you couldn't have just perpetual contractors. Um, so this topic has come up a lot in the last year. And of course, you know, Game Workers Unite popped up at GDC last year. Now, what's really interesting to me is about the, the opinions about unionization. So 10 years ago, the quality of life serving the IGDAs, there was 32% expressed an interest that, yes, I would join a union if one got started. 2014, the first year of the developer satisfaction survey, it was 56% said the same thing. So five years later, um, in 2017, um, the same people who helped us with 
the IGDA survey, they conducted their own survey because that's what they do. They study labor in the game industry. They've been doing this for their entire academic careers. So they did their own study. They found that there was 66% support for a local union and 82% for industry-wide. It's a crazy amount of numbers. And then just earlier this year, the GDC State of the Industry survey, they found that 73% said either yes or maybe to the creation of a union. Um, so to break down those last numbers, so the GDC one, this is where they said 47% said yes, 26 said maybe, about do you think that workers should unionize? So there's a lot of support for the should question, but then the interesting one is will they? And of course there's less certainty about that. Only 21% said yes, that they think that it'll actually happen. Um, so of course the verdict is still out right now. Um, the key notion behind all of this is, is the notion of collective bargaining. So that's really what we're getting at. And that when we look to Hollywood with, with what, what exactly do the unions do for the workers there, well, the, they, it's collective bargaining. They basically bring, make sure that there's a certain agreement in place with management that people will get paid a certain amount for a certain amount of work, and this is all agreed. It's not, you know, once it's once it's set in stone, it's set in stone. It's like I last year I went and I did a, a consulting project at a university in the Netherlands. So I was living in the Netherlands for six months, and when I get there, um, they basically said, "Here's the salary you're going to get." I'm like, well, don't I get to talk about it? No. It's been collectively bargained. Now, what's interesting, they didn't do it through a union. They did it through a different mechanism that they have over there. Um, but they basically had representatives um, of that industry, in this case, the education industry within the Netherlands, basically, without actually having a formal union, they have a negotiation with the government, basically decide that for different levels of university or whatever, this is what you get paid for doing a certain kind of job. So when I went over and took that project, basically said, this is what you're getting paid. That's it, non-negotiable. I'm like, okay, well, I should have should have thought about that. Anyway, um, no, it was it was great. It was a fun project. So collective bargaining, basically, when a group of less powerful individuals with similar goals unite to negotiate against a more common, more powerful opponent, and maybe that makes it too adversarial sounding. It doesn't have to be adversarial. It's basically where you know the people who have less power want to ensure that they have a certain level of control over the conditions and the, certainly the amount of pay that they get. Now, there's a lot of different forms of worker leverage out there. The most common forms, of course, unions that we hear about all the time. There's also guilds, and there's also legal defense funds. So these are just three that I'm going to address uh, briefly here and, and discuss. So guilds. So a guild is basically a collective bargaining organization for independent contractors. That's what it is. And guilds have been around for ever i mean this is this is one from europe where basically um what they used to have in europe um in medieval times this one is obviously more recent but what you would do is as you would go into the town in the medieval times or in the middle ages you would see a signpost like this which basically tells you that here are the different unions that are present in this town so if you wanted to get something done like you wanted to go and get like you know, uh, uh, the wheels made or barrels made or whatever it might be, you can go there and say, oh, great, I, I just, that's why I'm here. I need 50 barrels made. So great, I found a barrel maker. Um, and so this has been around for a very long time. The, the, the idea of guilds goes all the way back to Roman times. Even in Rome, they had guilds of certain kinds where the, where the guild people who did certain, uh, certain jobs banded together um, to basically help um, assure that they're all going to get paid fairly. And so this concept has gone on for a very long time. Um, in, the, in Hollywood, this is what we see a lot in Hollywood. So like the Screen Actors Guild, the Directors Guild, all of these, these are actually guild structures because most of these people are independent contractors. If you're a director or if you're a producer or an actor, you're not employed necessarily. You used to be. You used to be like employed by, say, 20th Century Fox or Paramount back in like the 30s and 40s when the studios basically ruled everything in Hollywood with an iron fist. And you had superpowers like, you know, Samuel Goldwyn and people like that who just had tremendous amounts of power in the industry. In a lot of ways, I see the game industry right now is very similar to Hollywood in the 30s and 40s, where the studio has the control. They've got the power, and basically they're the ones who set the terms, and basically if you don't want to work for them or if you sign a contract with them, you're working for them. I mean, basically you do what they tell you to do. And you don't have the freedom like actors, many actors do now, where they have more freedom to kind of go between projects. Um, and so, they, so a lot of Hollywood is built still on the guild structure, 
Now, unions, though, that tends to be a collective bargaining organization for actual employees, so not for contractors, but for employees. That's one of the core differences between guild and union. So now unions, of course, this, this one of the things, it's a continuous association of wage earners to maintain and improve the conditions of their employment. That's basically what it is. So usually that's what brings them together to form a union at a company or form a union in a certain locale or to form a union in an industry is they all agree that the conditions under which we work suck and we'd want them to be like this instead. We tried one-on-one -on -one to talk to management to change things. Management isn't gonna listen. So all of us are going to go to management instead collectively and basically try and bargain with management that this is the way we want it to work. And then of course it's up to management to either say you're all fired or okay, let's talk. Um, and so that's why we, we've reached that kind of inflection point just yesterday with the riot walkout. It's very interesting to follow this story to see how that's gonna develop. And the, because the key thing, as I was commenting on a lot of people who were posting the story about the walkout, it's, it's one thing to walk out, and I think it's great that they did to show this kind of solidarity, but it's like, but what do you do next? You go back, what did they do? They walked out for a couple hours and they went back in and got back to work. But then that's the question, what do you do next? Well, you can, basically you're testing management. So, like, so what, is, what is Riot's management going to do next? We don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Um, now, of course, unions, too, is a concept that's been around for quite a while. The modern unions that we know today started in the 18th century, or excuse me, in the 19th century. Um, they actually started in the UK initially, and it wasn't always a positive interaction. This is a union in the early 20th century being faced off by the National Guard because basically we were being forced to go back to work. Um, so the government actually called out the National Guard to tell the workers to go back to work. Um, and of course, it's universal as well. You, there's unions that exist all over the world. It's, a, it's, it's not unique to the West or anywhere. Um, there's even unions in somewhere as peaceful and nice as Finland. So um, what's really interesting, though, I just came across this chart fairly recently. It's the study that was done by the Economic Policy Institute that shows that as union membership falls, as it says, income concentrates at the top. So you can see here, starting in the early 20th century, as union membership continued to climb, the income of the top 10% of society was dropping. There was a more equalization with, the, with greater unionization. And as, we, as we've gone from that point, basically back around World War II and since World War II, we've seen less and less unionization and we've seen a tremendous amount of aggregation of wealth at the top. Of course, we hear that all the time. We, we hear these discussions about the 1%. And we, we, you know, this has hit our industry as well, the story about Activision Blizzard. You know, how their CEO gets this record payout because of the record profits of the company and at the same time they lay off hundreds of people. Um, and so what's also interesting is that they show that unionization tends to also equalize the pay between gender a bit better. And that's, I think, that's to me sort of a no-brainer because when you have, um, when a union collectively bargains, you basically set rates for certain types of jobs. It doesn't matter who's in the job. And so you're, it's more likely that no matter who is in the job, you're going to get the same pay. Um, but it's interesting that it actually helps equalize the gender gap to some degree. Um, and there are a couple of unions that exist. This one, Game Makers in Finland, has been around for a while. It's kind of a quiet one. It's, it's very local. Um, STJV started two years ago in France. Um, not a lot of people blinked when that happened. I mean, I think it's great that it happened. Um, I think the reason not a lot of people reacted because, you know, when it's Tuesday in France, you create a union. So um, it's, it's, it's a common activity there is my point. It's, it's not something that's like earth shattering that France would start a union. Um, what's more interesting, though, is, to, is last year when Game Workers Unite, that group became very vocal at GDC and just kind of popped out out of nowhere um, talking about the issue of unionization. And then um, just earlier this year in January, the Game Workers Unite group in the UK actually became a union. They partnered with the, the Independent Workers Guild within the UK. So this is now an official union um, within the UK. And so we, cu we currently have at least three unions in the game industry that are very local to these three locales. And that's generally how unions work. You're not gonna have a union that's international. That basically, actually legally can't really happen. But you can have unions that start within a company or at a no national scale or whatever it might be. 
Um, now, the other thing to think about, too, as far as leverage, I mean, unions are one way to do it to, to, for the purpose of collectively bargaining. The other thing that, that um, is, is, uh, can help is legal defense funds. So basically, there are a lot of groups out there, social groups, political groups, that have legal defense funds, mainly for the purpose of providing access to legal counsel, helping people pay legal expenses, especially those who can't afford it. That's really why the fund gets created. And they also educate on labor laws and worker rights. So when you get some kind of pushback within a company or you get into some problem, um, you, it actually gives you a place to go and, and say, okay, I need help. Um, now, personally, myself, while I've been very interested in unions for even when I was still part of the IGDA because I'm trying to be very open-minded because, again, my whole my whole impetus, my whole goal is to make sure game developers are protected so all they can do is just focus on working and being paid fairly and treated well because their physical and mental wellness means a tremendous amount to me. And that's what I want to see happen, and I don't think we're really seeing that codified yet in our industry. And so, um, so while there's a lot of push people doing unions, what I'm doing personally, I'm actually focusing on creating this, um, the Game Creators Legal Defense Fund. So this has been a lot of my focus over the last year or so, um, and I'm hoping to actually launch it this year. It takes a long time to get this kind of stuff started, and frankly, it doesn't help when the government shuts down for several weeks either. Um, so basically what the point of this would be is to basically help fill in the gap. So like for people who, for whom unions may not be an answer. So my personal opinion is that will a union help an indie studio? Well, it doesn't make any sense to me that a five-person studio would unionize because they're all kind of technically co-owners in a way, depending on how it's set up. So it, that wouldn't make sense to me, but you would have a resource for indies where it's like before they sign that publisher contract, they can actually go get advice and get help and have somebody read it. That kind of goes back to the conversation I had with a couple publishers when I was talking with them about the Legal Defense Fund at GDC this year. And one of them told me, they said, it, it's shockingly easy to take advantage of an indie. And I don't like doing it and I don't do it, but I know people who do because they said part of the problem is I'll get indies coming into my office and I say, here's the contract for publishing your game. And so they're like, okay, we're, we're gonna sign this right here because frankly they need the money and they're like well no you need to take this home and you need to show it to your counsel we can't afford a lawyer well do you have any friends who are lawyers can you ask somebody to do you have anyone experienced in the industry that you can show this to and just get another part of feet get some other feedback on this contract and they said sometimes the indie will actually say i'm not leaving here without signing this I came here to sign this today. I'm signing this today. And they're like, but <laughs> they're, and they're like, but I don't want you to sign it. I want you to read it and I want you to understand it. Like, well, okay, well, I'll sit here and I'll read it. And so they'll sit here and read it for like an hour or two. And they're like, well, do you understand it? Yes. So I'm going to sign it now. You know, well, so one, one group that I met in Europe, they, they already told me they really want to support this. They're a small company because they said that ex that's exactly what happened to them. They signed their first publisher contract. They thought they were being very diligent about reading all the fine print, what the, but because they did not have the legal skill, there was one sentence that was in the contract and it was worded in such a way that they didn't quite understand the wording, but, it was, they, didn't have, but they didn't have enough legal knowledge to call it out. That one sentence basically signed over their IP to this publisher. So then when it came time to collect the revenue because their game was successful, they said, okay, where's our cut? So it's not your game. You signed it away to us. We paid you for the development of the game, but the game belongs to us and all the revenue is going to us. And so you can imagine what happened after that. So, and it's like, what's the recourse? There is none. They signed the contract. And so that kind of crap happens a lot in our industry. And that's that unfairness that's out there. And so I, I, Having heard many of these stories, that's part of my goal is to create a resource that can help people with that. Or, or I hear people about getting harassed at their company, like a AAA company, they escalate it to management and management does nothing about it. You know, or you know, that we hear that kind of story all the time. So to me, there's a lot of scenarios where this kind of thing can actually help um, in, in other ways. So it's, I think it's definitely a complementary form of leverage um, to things like unions or guilds or whatever. The key, the key issue though is will all of these forms of leverage prevent incompetent management, um, like Telltale? Um, will it prevent crunch? Will it prevent layoffs and all these other things? And I think we all know the answer to the, the answer is no. 
It's not going to stop those things from happening because those things tend to be just human behavior. You can't regulate stupidity. Um, but I do think we can, yeah, as I said, you can, it will buffer game creators against the effects of these things. So for example, like with Telltale, with the huge debacle that happened at that company, at least the workers would have had severance pay. They would have been guaranteed benefits as a result of what happened. And of course, there's a class action lawsuit going on around that whole case right now. So it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. Um, but basically, the way I look at it, our goal as a creator advocate then, we're not trying to change the whole world. And that's oftentimes where people get stuck when they finally reach a point where they say, I want to make a difference. They think about all the problems we have in this industry and, and just like it's daunting. You're just like, there's no way we're going to fix everything. That's not the point. The point is to pick that one thing that really pisses you off most or drives that righteous rage and say, that's the part I'm going to try and fix. And I've met people who've basically reached that point. And so in some cases, it's a really hyper specific thing. And it's very local in some cases, but that's what they're going to devote their energies to. And I think that's really great because ultimately, you know, I think if everyone is doing that to some degree, we do collectively change everything. And so I, I really don't want to get an email like this again, where I hear people afraid who have that tremendous passion for working in games, and yet they're afraid to actually graduate and get their first job. And I was really encouraged because just on this last trip, I was traveling for three and a half weeks and speaking in Europe, and I just got back last Monday, and I talked to this one student. She graduated recently, and she we had talked last year about these issues, and she actually turned down her first job offer because she asked them, as I encourage students to do, you need to ask them about their crunch, you need to ask them about diversity, you know, and if they say, well, we're working on it, it's like, well, what exactly are you doing? How, what, tell me what programs you're doing, tell me how you're trying to improve the conditions here, and if they don't give you a satisfactory answer, you should walk, and it's a really difficult thing to do, but she said when she turned down that first offer, she felt so empowered that she actually said no, and good for her, she actually found something a couple months later a really good situation. So, um, it, but it takes a lot of courage to do that. And that's part of the thing that I'm seeing right now. I think we're seeing, I hope to see a trend of more collective courage where people are willing to stand up and talk. So there you go. <laughs> So we have questions, call whatever you want to do. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Kate. So thank we have you. these two mics. Um, yeah, anyone that wants has any questions, remember just to hold it like this. Don't hold it sideways, that doesn't work. <laughs> hold it up, uh, switch it off. If you're not speaking, switch it on, wait a second. And you have a first question? Larry? <laughs> <laughs> So um, coming at this from a little bit of a, of a different perspective, and this is a conversation that we've had before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm reluctant to admit it, but I am management um, from a company that- I'm just kidding. <laughs> from a company that does do publishing contracts with, with independents. And uh, one of the things that I hope to work with, with you on, on an ongoing basis is, is how can we be better? Mm -hmm. um, my, um, my biggest concern uh, is that we're relatively small studio. We have 20 people. We're 100% distributed. There is no office. Well, the good part is you never have to come into the office. The bad part is you never really have to leave the office. Um, I try to go to all of my developers and say things like, did you eat today? When was the last time you slept? Um, and, and, and that's fine on a one-to-one -one basis. But if my company doubled in size, as, as we kind of you know, would hope it would do, it's a lot of people to ask if they ate, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to, to talk to you, and I'd like to, to you know, continue the conversation on how small companies can be better. Because I think if we start on that level, and it's manageable, that we can scale it up. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of it depends on what culture you decide to forge in the company and that starts with management i mean that's the tone that you set i mean my personal my personal philosophy of management because I've, I've managed people at microsoft managed people and ran the igda is that management to me means service 
That's my approach. So it's like you're serving the needs of the people underneath you. You are not cracking a whip. You are not leading the charge. It's like it's a lot of people forget, like when you have a flock of sheep, what's important about the flock of sheep? It's not the shepherd. The sheep are the resource. The sheep are what matters. The shepherd's there to protect the flock from being harmed. That's why they have a shepherd's crook. They're there to protect the flock and to guide the flock. They're not there to beat the flock into submission and tell them, you know, you need to produce more wool. You know, that's not their job um, because they're just going to do what they do best. And you just got to let them do it and cultivate that. And um, that culture has to be explicit. And I think it has to be reinforced on a constant basis. And, and I think really it's like it's it's unfortunate because I think a lot of management that I've encountered, they the qualitative aspects of management are so critical, especially in creative fields, because creative people, we are sensitive, we are imaginative, we're, you know, I mean, everyone is, I mean, every human being matters. But I'm saying even in the creative fields, I, I've noticed there's an extra level of of. I, for, I don't know what the word would be, tenderness that's required. I mean, I don't know. You could pick a different word for that. Um, you know, uh, conscientiousness about the people's Emp needs. Empathy. Empathy, yes. I mean, that's a better word probably. Um, we have to have that extra level of empathy, I think, and try and employ that when we interact with people. Uh, and it's like I do with the mental health uh, issues that I'm doing. It's like ask people not just like, well, how is your work going? It's like, how are you you know, how, how are you holding up? It's like, you don't look like you, you know, you're, you're giving your best today, you know, and that's, that's just part of the, the crazy thing about our society. It's like, you can come in on a Monday morning with a broken leg and people will have outpouring of sympathy. Can I get you a cup of coffee? What happened? Are you okay? And if you come in on Monday morning and say, I just don't feel like working today. I, I think I, I, I feel depressed. It's like, well, maybe just work hard and push through it. You'll be okay. You know, or, or just like, I'll tell you a bunch of jokes and you'll feel better. It's just, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we try and, because I we know we want to help our fellow workers. We want to help them out and make them feel better. But, I mean, having lived with someone who was, was cro with chronic depression, there's basically nothing you're going to do to get them out of it. You just have to let them know you're there, you know, and that you care. But you can't push the issue. So just like you can't, like, magically make that leg get not broken, so, <laughs> so um, if you know people who are going through a, a crunch time or they're continuously at a place that that, that is happening at, what would you suggest as like a, uh, as a way to, to help or to empower them to possibly, you know, like, speak up or mm -hmm. figure out a better situation for themselves? I, I, that's a great question. I think to me the number one thing is they have to talk to their fellow people because inevitably if you're in an environment where you're crunching, you're feeling like this is really problematic for me because I'm working like 14-hour days or something, there will certainly be others around you who feel the same way. And if you're not talking with these other people about it, then that's a problem. And and um, you know, and I think, and I know because a lot of the company cultures that we have these days, it doesn't come up because you don't want to feel like you're not a team player. You don't want to sound like you're complaining, you know. But I think there are ways that you can kind of bring it up with a fellow worker, saying, "Hey, do you, do you think we work too much here?" You know, of course, it might people like, "Ha ha yeah, of course we do." It's like, no, I'm serious. Don't you think we work too much? It's like, I'm not sleeping. I'm not getting enough sleep. I don't get to see my family. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, I think the dialogue has to start. And, um, and I think certainly if it gets to the point where people want to talk to management about it and, and like lodge a complaint, it has to be done collectively. If you have one person go up there, it's not going to do anything. It's like, well, yeah, you go take off tomorrow, but come back for the next day and keep pushing onward. Um, it has to be a group of people, I think. Um, and the, the other thing, too, that we have to watch out in the dynamic is, you know, when we use the term crunch, to me, tr crunch is top down imposed by management. That's where management says you will work a certain number of hours because we've got this deadline that's looming because I have really shitty project management skills. So that's why we're in this predic predicament in the first place. Um, but at the same time, you know, there we almost always have crunch periods like towards the end of a project. And I think that's true pretty much in every creative art form. And I think part of that is just because of the inherent nature of creation where it's never done. 
It's like, that, that's a reason why we have director's cuts of films because the director, they were pushing towards the date that it had to be in the theater and they just had to release what they, the best they could, but they have a chance to go back and just like we do too, we can have DLC. We just say, well, here's what we really wanted to put in there. Um, or, you know, or have a do-over, but that doesn't always work these days. But, um, so that's that's part of the problem too. But then we have the, the dynamic of groove, creative groove, which that also happens in every creative art form. And that's natural. That's where people will just naturally work extra hours because they're in that headspace where it's really productive in a really positive way. Um, like uh, Noah Falstein once told me a story when they were at LucasArts working on, uh, on Monkey Island. I remember he was saying that there was a moment where they um, – I think he was saying they, they got to where they were working on a certain problem they had to kind of push through and they were in, got into a really good discussion about it. And they said, well, let's, it was dinner time. So let's go to dinner together. So they went to dinner and talked it out. And then like, and then they were like, the epiphany happened at dinner. So like, let's go back and do it. So they went back and basically worked all night long and they got this thing done, which basically changed the game as we know it today in a really positive way, but they did it for one night. And that's, you know, that's great. That's creative groove. No manager was telling them to do it. They just did it. And I think that's that's allowable. We can let that happen. But the the when it's in post crunch, um, like that's we have a white paper we did at Take This called Crunch Hurts, which I really recommend people read. It's only about 15 pages or so. We came out with it in October 2016. And it basically lays out the physiological and medical reasons why crunch doesn't work. And so it shows that the that humans basically can withstand about two weeks of that. And after two weeks, the ROI basically drops off to nil. And we and there's also a, a, a correlation made in that white paper that the more some companies crunch, the lower their Metacritic scores on their final game, which is crazy because that's usually the exact reason why you're being told to crunch is that you're going to make a, quote, better game. Um, so I think basically being open about it. I would even like pass the white paper to some people and say, hey, have you guys read this? It's like, this is, makes it sound like crunching like this is not a very good, good idea. Or even forward it to management and just say, hey, you think you better read this. Um, but again, I think the, the most important thing is, is A, being open about talking about it, but making sure it's collectively talked about, not just you know one-on-one, -on -one, but as a group. And I know that can be difficult to do because breaching that subject you know, and so you kind of have to start with people that you trust um, or work well with and kind of see how it goes. But it's, yeah, it, t it does take a certain amount of courage to do it. So. Um, so it, it, I love the legal defense fund that, that exists. I'm definitely going to have to use that as a small <laughs> studio sometime soon. But I'd like to know uh, as an individual, what can I or what can we do to help support that? Because I know more individuals supporting that would lead it to be stronger and more effective. The Legal Defense Fund? Or, In particular, or any local well, I unions. Think, well, I think any of that really is that, first of all, the main thing, and this is what I love about Game Workers Unite, like a lot of people, um, I think some misperceive exactly what they're doing. What they're really doing, it's, it's a massive education campaign. It's like, this, this is what your rights are as a worker. Um, you know, and, and for example, one of the conversations I had with some lawyers who were helping me out with the Legal Defense Fund is they said, you know, if you want to get some easy wins with this fund, all you have to do is go after some companies based in California who are violating California labor law because California labor law tends to be pretty robust. And they said, that's all you have to do because they're like, we know there's a bunch of companies that violate it every day. So you just basically have to pick the ones you want to call out and, you know, take them to court or threaten court threaten legal action and see what happens. And I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. So basically I think it's, it's, it's kind of like what's happening right now. Like I think just today, Game Workers Unite was putting out a call on Twitter for people to make comments, I think about Quantic Dream, about some of the allegations going on there about working conditions and other things going on. A lot of it has to do with actually coming to light with actual issues that are happening. So who's willing to speak up? And so this kind of uh, approaches the issue of whistleblowing. Um, which we see in a lot of industries where they actually have a mechanism for whistleblowing. I know that Game Workers Unite has been talking about creating a mechanism for that. I actually think they have one already on their website. And I think that's really important, that people need to be willing to speak up 
even if it's an initial submission to a whistleblowing form or something, but they have to express the issue. They have to make sure that it comes to light. And I think the more people doing that, the better. And, you know, the, the thing is, and this is where when I have conversations with a lot of my C-level friends who I love, their colleagues I've known for a long time, but when I, they hear me talking about unions and all this, they get like, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk to you anymore. Um, I'm like, look, the bottom line, nobody wants to see strikes. No one wants to see walkouts. No one wants to see any you know, legal action taking place. What we want to do is just work on games and do what we love. My whole point in creating a legal defense fund and supporting unionization is this very idealistic hope, because I realize I'm idealistic. At least I'm, I'm, I've confronted myself about that. Um, it's my idealistic hope that some companies, if not many or the majority, will see this stuff happening and say, hey, I think we better get our act together. I think maybe there's things we're doing that we can improve upon because we don't want to have a lawsuit lodged against us or we don't want to have a union form in our company. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But my idealistic hope is that there are people out there who run these companies who are actually going to look objectively at the landscape and say, I think maybe it's time to take a really deep look at our practices. Um, there was a company in Sweden I talked to, it was I think early last year, well, I, I was I, I found out what they did basically is so some employees were were complaining about a gender wage gap. This is a game company, and so they were complaining that there was a, a gender wage gap in the company. They presented some evidence because in a lot of European cultures they they openly publish what they make, and so like why is this woman making less than this guy? And they are in the exact same position at the same level. It doesn't make any sense. They even have somewhat similar experience. So why are they making different amounts? So they challenged management on this. And they said, we think you need to look into the possibility that there's a gender wage gap and you need to kind of take a, take a look at it. And so the management being mature people, they said, okay, you know what, we will, we'll look at it because we had enough people come to us and complain about it. So they did, they, they took a deep look into it. They basically told HR, we want you to investigate this. We want you to see what, what it looks like across all the different types of jobs. Do we have a gender wage gap? They came back and said, yes, we do. We actually do. And they said, okay, well, we need to fix this. So they actually committed to taking action on it, which they did. And I, in my understanding is it took them about three months or so to work out all the numbers, but then they hit a certain date where all the numbers changed. So some people, now they obviously tried to minimize the, the decrease for some people, but some people did see a decrease, not a ton, but they did see something. But there was one woman who saw a 70% increase in her salary and she almost quit. And because it's like, I, you know, her realization that she was undervalued by that much for that long and it just shook her, you know, but she decided to stay because, well, it's a 70% increase and she was getting a commitment from them that, look, we, we are actually trying to do better. We're trying to show you that we take this, these complaints seriously. <clears throat> and I think if, Hoping for that kind of maturity in management is is maybe a false hope, but I do think there are really good people out there. I mean, I know a lot of these C-level people. I think they're fantastic people. Um, I do think that if they're confronted with the possibility of workers having actual leverage, that they will take a serious look at this stuff and maybe think, you know, okay, we're actually going to you know do something like this and change it. That's my hope anyway. And so, but it all comes down to the fact that people need to speak up. They need to escalate it to their management collectively, um, or they need to use whistleblowing. They need to do something to, to vocalize, because otherwise, a lot of the reason why this has all been so kind of systemic and just kind of humming along for decades now is because people don't have the courage to speak up and to report it. That was a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so Mike. <laughs> Long day, sorry. Um, in my case, I have a year I have a year left in college before I graduate and go into the games industry. Uh, what type of advice would you have for someone in my case of you know going less already side more programming mm -hmm. or for you know and entry field? So. Yeah, well, I think my my core advice that I give to a lot of students is first of all have have a pretty good idea of what you actually want to do, um, but don't be too wedded to it. 
Um, because, you, I mean, obviously you need to have some direction, but for, I think for a lot of people, I I know a lot of people who've come into this industry where they got their entry job, whether it was programming or something, and then they found out that they love producing. And in some cases, they may have had to go back to school to pick up additional skills, but in other cases, they worked kind of worked their way towards that other position. Um, and so so I think, guess for one thing, be be somewhat clear on where you want to head out of school but also be flexible once you're in the industry um because you don't you don't know exactly and plus the fact that the industry continues to change it is dynamic and there's different kinds of jobs that continue to evolve with the technology and, and the uh, methods of distribution and everything so you can be open to that as well um the other thing too is make sure that when you go into an interview ask really blunt questions because I've talked to a lot of HR managers, I've talked to a lot of executives who say they love candidates who ask blunt, challenging questions. So don't just sugarcoat it and say, wow, I really love what you guys do here. I can't wait to work here. You know, I love, I've played your game for 500 hours and it really speaks to me. Whatever. It's like they want to know, like, you know, are you a good fit in the company? But more importantly, how are you going to help change the direction of the company? Because I think a lot of people who go into the industry, they don't view themselves as future talent. They view themselves as just trying to desperately get a job. But but what's really important is that you are the future of the industry, unequivocally. You will you are the future of the industry. You will be the person who is going to GDC and speaking on stage and all that kind of stuff someday. Um, when we're going to be like, oh, well, I will be long dead. But um, the um, and so it's important to, to remember that is that is is that level of desperation is is difficult co to control because I know I was there I I got I was at a point where I graduated from school and had to find a job it's even worse coming out of grad school because then you're like I spent all this time for what but um, <laughs> anyway but um, but I think make sure you have a very clear questions to ask them be blunt about it. Figure out what's important to you. So be introspective about what, I mean, it sounds sappy, but what would make you happy in terms of working, you know, where you would want to work? I mean, for some people, it, it, it varies for all of us. For some people, it's the location. I want to get a job in San Francisco. It's like, well, you know, I hope you like paying 5000 a month on rent. But um, for other, for other, so for some, it depends what's important. For some people, it's the locale. Some people don't care. I'll work anywhere in the world. I just want to do what I do. For some people, it's working on a certain type of game. For some people, it's working on a certain franchise. I've met people who say, I want to work for 343 Industries because I love Halo. And that's my whole life's goal is to work on Halo. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, it's nice to have that goal. I mean, it's kind of constricts your, you know, your path to quite a degree, but it's good to have a goal. Um, so have some kind of conception around that. Um, but then, like I said, when you go into a company, make sure you ask the blunt questions and make sure if you are not getting the answers you want that you raise the point. You know, So you challenge the, the hiring manager, challenge the HR person on their answer. Um, because honestly, a lot of those people I talk to who are in those positions, they like being challenged. They like somebody who actually is going to question the way things are, because um, that, that, that's kind of where I was going with that point about you being the future of the industry, because you're also the future of that company. And so if you see a better way to do things, or if you have a conception for how they can improve upon something, or if you say, well, are, do you guys do this kind of program here? And they say, no. You say, well, have you thought about doing it? Um, you know, whatever it might be. And I mean, they want to hear that kind of thing. So that's, that's some of the advice that I would give. Um, and, it, and honestly, it does take courage to say no. It takes courage to, answer, to ask those blunt questions. And so you kind of have to really kind of steel yourself up for that. Um, but I but I'd highly recommend doing it. You know, and it's like if you don't, I think the first time you go through an interview cycle, it's really nerve wracking. You know, especially when you, because it's like you're in, at this company, especially depending on who the company is, it's like you go to Microsoft or Sony or somewhere like that, and it's like you don't want to piss them off or something, but you should challenge them. You sh I don't know what else to say. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, the previous question before that, you touched on the concept of sharing uh, wages, which is something I yes. really agree with. Here in America, it's very taboo yes. to share wages, and that gives a lot of power to management, where 
someone gets a job and they think, oh, that's what everyone makes. I, I like to share how much money we all make because I think that benefits everybody. And uh, particularly, I also see it from another angle of since uh, Steam's API changed and mm -hmm. Steam Spy is no longer viable, yep. having to go back to estimating uh, Steam sales based on review counts and that whole thing. Right. Um, what do you, how should we as an industry go about um, making that change, making um, salaries and sales more public? Well, I think, I mean, with salaries, it's easy. That's just a matter, that's a movement. That's people just publishing, here's my salary, and just be willing, being willing to do it. Um, it's not hard to do. Everyone could do that today if they wanted to. Um, it's just a matter of having that, again, having the courage to actually start it. Um, I know there's actually some groups on Facebook that I'm a part of. Like there's a few secret women's groups that I'm a part of because frankly, during like the whole Gamergate episode, many of us kind of had to go underground to have a safe space so we could actually talk to each other. Um, and in some of those groups, everyone openly shares their salary. And there was one person who started a thread on it and said, hey, who's with me? Here's what I make per year. Here's what my benefits are. And then people just said, well, here's mine, here's mine, here's mine, here's mine. And it was great. It was amazing to have that kind of knowledge. Um, because like I said, in Europe, it's like that's common. I mean, it's pretty much common knowledge. Like I talked about uh, being in the Netherlands with the collectively bargain rates. Well, you you know, if you know what their, what their position is at the school, then you can easily find out how much they make because it's all public. It's all public knowledge because there's not that stigma around it. It's like that just happens to be what you make. It's just the way it is. Um, and so I think that's one thing that we can do is that and just people start sharing or, you know, and I think even somebody I saw somewhere, I don't remember who it was, but they created a Google, uh, Google Doc, a spreadsheet where they just started collecting all of this stuff where they just said, well, here's what an artist at Riot makes and here's what an artist at Microsoft makes because this person told me and that person told me. They didn't put their names, of course. They were just putting the numbers um, to just start making this like massive comparative list. And I would love to see that. I think a lot of people would love to see that. Um, and now as far as sales numbers, well, that's a whole other problem. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like that That gets into the whole corporate realm. It's about, you know, companies showing their cards. Um, I think Steam is, you know, Steam is, is a classic dark, dark night issue where it's like they've lived long enough to become the villain, in my opinion. You know, it's like the indie revolution that we went through was would not have been possible without Steam. And I think many of us recognize that. But at the same time, the evolution of that platform uh, into being what it is now, which I just, I, this, this, I, this is a tangent, I'm sorry. It really pisses me off because when we are trying to engage the public with, with gameplay, so for example, I get asked all the time by people who say, hey, I'm interested in playing games. I don't, I don't own a console. Um, I'm just, you know, I, 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 I'm really interested in playing some, some kind of games. Um, like, where do I go? And like, well, you can go to the iOS store or the Google Play store and try and find a game on there. It's like, well, it's not curated, really. It's like, well, it has ratings, but they're all kind of BS ratings. And um, it's like, okay, well, what if I go to Steam? It's like, well, yeah, you can go on Steam and try and find something that interests you. How the hell does somebody do that on Steam? It's like you send them there and it's just like this wall of thousands of games. There's no way for them to really navigate this. Now there's a certain level of curation going on, but frankly, this is where the the model of the film industry really kicked our asses with, with the old blockbuster video stores. Because at most video stores back in the day when they still existed, you had, you know, the people who ran those stores tend to be huge film fanatics. That's why they ran a video store. And so they would have they would curate all the different sections like sci-fi and horror and drama and romance and everything. They often would have like special sections like here's, you know, here's like the top five romance films of the year, things like that. There's websites where you can go and find like here's the 50 best sci-fi films of all time and here's why. And it's all curated for you and you can understand that. We don't really have that in our industry. You can't point somebody to say, I want to, you know, I want to see what the top 25 shooters of all time are and why are they the best shooters and why would I play any of these? Um, and of course, we also have legacy issues too because some of these shooters or some of these games that we have on different platforms, well, the platforms don't exist anymore. And so the games are like in you know, historical limbo, which is a whole nother problem we have um, because that's the advantage film has is that the film has been captured on video or digitized so you can see it somewhere. 
but we don't have that issue. But um, anyway, um, that's a huge tangent for your question. <laughs> um, I don't think there's any easy way to get companies to, to divulge sales numbers mm -hmm. um, because it's all about competitive advantage and they all see it as a competitive thing. And so for them to divulge numbers. So that basically goes to the fact that, again, goes back to a certain level of courage of a, some, of, of a certain company saying, you know what, we are going to divulge our numbers. Mm -hmm. We're going to tell you exactly what's being made because we just think people want to know. And to see if that kind of calls out other companies to do the same behavior. Yeah, and I, and I think it's um, we're, we're certainly... Gonna, we, we've got about the warning. That okay. We need to, oh, yeah. Um, I, I want to just add one other point on this, and I don't need the microphone for it. There's, there is one other solution to this problem that you raised. How do you find out if you're going to get to the right job? How do you know about that? One of the things is, it's certainly not the only answer, but one of the things is to belong to something like the IGDA. We meet with other people in your industry, and you can frankly exchange opinions because without that there you can't go anywhere. So guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.